אותו בשבוע השני, הדמוקרטיה פיקתה, תדבר איתנו על בעצם GNN, זה משהו תיאורטי שסוף סוף אפשר להגיד עליהם, הוא מאוניברסיטת תל אביב, מאוניברסיטת אפל, Okay. Hi everyone. So first off, it's uh, great to finally be here. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. What I will present today is based off of a recent work where we analyze the expressive power of graph neural networks in terms of their ability to model interactions between vertices. This was a joint work with Tom Verbin, who was a master student at the lab, and my advisor, Nadal Kohl. I'll start by giving some context and... Yeah. Okay. I'll bring it in English just for... It's good for practice. Well. But you can ask questions here. So uh, I'll start by giving some context. And I'm not assuming any prior knowledge here about graph neural networks. So what are graph neural networks? Or in short, GNNs. These are simply a family of neural network architectures that are designed to operate over data that is structured as a graph. Okay, intuitively, their purpose is to model complex interactions over graphs. Two common paradigms in which we use them is first graph prediction tasks. Here, we use the GNN to make a single prediction over the whole graph. The prime example here is molecular data. Each molecule is a graph. The vertices are the atoms, and the edges are the bonds between them. Say, for example, we get multiple molecules as our training set, and the label is whether they're toxic or not. We'll train a GNN such that given a new molecule, a new graph, we can make a prediction over it, whether it's toxic or not. A second common paradigm is vertex prediction. Here we often have just one large graph, such as a social network, and instead of making a prediction over the whole graph, we make a prediction over each of the vertices separately, okay? say whether a user likes something or not. So here we'll get as a training set multiple labels from the graph, okay? only a subset of the labels, and we will train a gen over the graph such that we can predict the labels for the missing vertices, okay? the ones that we don't see the labels for them. So molecular data and social networks, these are two common applications, but besides them in recent years, genes have been applied in really a wide array of domains, whether it's recommender systems or estimating the time of arrival in Google Maps, for example. And so there's a significant interest in developing a mathematical theory behind them, so we can better understand why they work and the limitations. And one of the fundamental questions that such a theory should address is expressivity. Okay, given a genin architecture, which classes of functions can we realize? To be more concrete, let's say we have the set of all functions over graphs. Then what we would like to characterize is, out of these, which functions can we realize using certain GNNs? And perhaps even more interesting is to characterize which functions we can realize using GNNs of a practical size. Okay, say a size that is polynomial in the parameters of the problem. Because in the end, these are the networks that we can really run. Now, in recent years, the expressivity of GNNs has been studied quite a lot. And what we know largely falls into three categories. So the first one, and by far the most popular, these are works that analyze the ability of GNNs to distinguish between non-isomorphic graphs. Two graphs are said to be isomorphic if they are the same up to a different labeling of the vertices. Okay? These are basically the same graph if they're isomorphic. And these line of works, they look at different GNN architectures, and they characterize which classes of graph they can distinguish or cannot. When I say that a genome can distinguish between two graphs, I mean that there exists a setting for its weight, okay, for the parameters of the GNN, such that if you give it as an input this graph or this graph, it can out of different predictions if they're non isomorphic, okay, which is what we would want them to do so that we have maximal expressive capacity in some sense. And perhaps one of the most uh, well known results in the expressivity of genome is that the most common types of genes are limited in this sense. For example, these two graphs, then any one of the, these GNNs are called message passing GNNs. I'll formally introduce them a bit later on. Then they will necessarily output the same prediction over these two graphs if we ignore the fact that these vertices may have features. Okay. The second common line of results are proofs of universality. Here, for sufficiently wide and deep networks, what's proven is that we can express any function, continuous function over graphs, but subject to limitations in distinguishing certain graphs. Okay, so this is very much related to the first line results. Since certain GNNs cannot distinguish between two different graphs, okay, yeah. <coughs> 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 
Okay, so I'll formally define it later on, but in reality what we have, we have a graph, and each of the vertices has a vector of features. That's typically what we have, and this is, will be the setting that I'll consider in this talk. And this, these line of words, they typically ignore that. They typically assume that either there are no features or the features are the same or simply a node ID, and this is kind of a limitation in these words, and I'll also touch upon it. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is just the introduction, and we'll get to the analysis. We'll exactly introduce the set. Okay, so what I was going to say is that you can prove that these networks are universal, but subject to some limitations. Okay, there are some graphs that they will always predict the same thing. Now, the last type of results, these analyze which type of properties of the graph these GNNs can compute. And this also ignores any features that the vertices might have. Okay, these are functions that only depend on the structure of the graph. For example, it's diameter. And despite these recent progress, there's still several limitations to what we know. So first off, many of these analysis, not all of them, but many, they treat this asymptotic regime where the network width and depth is allowed to be unbounded. For example, this is true for the analysis of universality and ability to dis distinguish between non-isomorphic graphs. And hopefully, we would like to better understand what we can do with networks of a finite set, which we use in practice. The second limitation, which relates to what Shai asked, is that we still lack formalization for the ability of these GNNs to model interactions between the features of vertices. In other words, given an input graph, we can view the GNN as a function over the features that the vertices have. And we would like to better understand which type of functions they can express with respect to these features. Specifically here, we're interested in the strength of interactions that they can model between vertices for some formal measure of interactions. Okay, we'd like to understand what's the impact of the graph structure and the GNN architecture here. And this is exactly the question that we aim to address this gap. Essentially, we wanted to study how does the graph structure and the GNN architecture affect the strength of interactions that can model between vertices, between the features that the vertices have in the graph. Okay, so what am I going to show today? It's going to be two parts. The first is going to be a theoretical analysis, and then we're going to see a practical application of the theory. Okay, another name for this slide is perhaps the why should you care or why should you listen slide. These are the two things that I'm going to elaborate on for the rest of the talk. So first, in terms of the theory, we're going to formally characterize the ability of certain GNNs to model interactions between subsets of vertices, specifically between a partition of vertices in the graph. For example, this partition between the blue vertices and the red vertices. And we're going to do that using a measure known as separation mechanism. It has origins in physics, and of course, I'll formally introduce it in a few slides. I'll spoil the surprise and say that the main result is going to be that for a given graph in a partition of the vertices, what's primarily going to determine the strength of interactions that the GN can model is going to be the number of walks of a specific length that originate from this area here, the boundary of the partition. These are walks that originate from vertices which have an edge to the other side of the partition. Okay, so this is going to be the main theoretical result, and then we're going to use that for a practical application. We're going to derive an edge specification algorithm which tries to preserve the interactions that GNNs can model as we remove edges from the graph. The idea is that if we have a large graph, for example, a social network, then it can be quite expensive to run a GNN over. And one way to address this is to try and remove edges from the graph while maintaining the accuracy that we can get. And we'll see that our theoretical analysis will lead to a simple and efficient recipe for which edges you want to prune, and it will actually lead to higher prediction accuracy across the sparsified graphs than alternative methods. Okay, so this is what we're going to see today, and before I go on to more details, are there any questions about the introduction thus far? Plenty of questions, but please continue. Okay, sure. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll start off with the theoretical analysis. And first off, let's really formally define what are the GNNs that we're going to analyze. It's going to be a type of message passing GNNs. This is the most popular type of GNNs there are. And the idea behind them is quite simple. Okay, so the input to a GNN is a graph, such as the one here. And each of the vertices is associated with a vector of features. Okay, so there's one vector, this is a vector of features. There's one of them for each of the vertices in the graph. Yes, so it's all. And it's okay, so there's a vector of features. There, you can also consider, for example, features for the edges, but for this talk, let's keep it simple. There are just features for the vertices. 
And what the genes do, they associate a hidden embedding with each one of the vertices. And at each layer, they update this embedding using the neighbors. Okay, this is why it's called message passing. Essentially, you update your embedding using your neighbors. They pass messages to you. And in an illustration, this looks something like this. Okay, this is computing the embedding of vertex A with a one layer GNN. So you go over all of its neighbors. And typically, you can also consider itself. Okay, you consider self loops in the graphs. You do some transformation over the embedding of its neighbors, and then you aggregate these embeddings to get a new one for vertex A. And you can stack multiple of such layers and get these computations, these recursive computations of the embedding. To be more mathematically formal about it, so initially we set the head embedding of each of the vertices to be their features. Okay, so for vertex I, it's just the features of vertex I. And then a common update rule at a layer of a message passing GNN for a vertex I is as follows. We go over all the neighbors of vertex I. We make some transformation over their embeddings from the previous layer. Here, it's simply a linear transformation. And then we use some aggregation function to get our new embedding for the vertex. One common choice is to take the aggregation function to be a weighted sum followed by a ReLU. And this leads to what is known as the graph convolutional networks, this is, or GCN in short. This is by far the most popular GCN, GNN today. But also, other options are also common in fact. So after we ran L layers of this message passing layers, we get out embeddings for each of the vertices. And what we do with them really depends on the task at hand. Sorry, the yeah. update rule is the same for, there's no dependence on I here, on AG and W? So the dependence, it comes between with the neighbors of the vertex. So for each vertex, it has different neighbors. No, no, but at every iteration, at every layer, you're multiplying by the same W or the yes, same? Yes, okay, yes, yes. Okay, so each layer it has a different set of parameters, but typically uh, these weight measures are the same across all the neighbors uh, because you want to support different sizes of graphs and different number of vertices. Uh, but for example, people do you have different types of edges, so you can have different weight matrices for different edge types. For example, a different weight matrix for yourself. So you have a self loop, that's a different way. That's a common design choice as well. Okay, so you assume and, that the, the graph is connected? So we do not assume that the graph is connected uh, throughout, and in many cases this is not the case. But uh, yes. So but if it's not connected, then basically you run in parallel on the connected component of the graph, right? Right, yeah. So you can actually separate it. And uh, whether that creates problems or not, this is very much a uh, task dependent. You can all try to alleviate that in some way. For example, add edges in the graph or add connections. It's a question whether that's something good or not. So, my, my main concern is that I can cheat and uh, make all the edges have exactly the same vector and then revert back to a fully connected, uh, fully connected network, simply gotten an encoding of all the vertices in the graph and just, just do whatever it is. Uh, Great. So in terms of universality and being able to express all functions, if I understand what you're saying, so we can just treat these feature vertices and as they are and run a f fully connected network over them, and that's universal. So we have none of the issues that GNNs have. But the problem with that is not with expressivity. It might be also with finite size expressivity, but let's say put that aside, but it's in generalization often. And I'm not going to touch upon this talk, but a, for example, you lose one of the more desired properties of such a scheme and why it's so popular is that it's permutation invariant or equivariant, meaning if we permute the vertices of the features or the features of the vertices, then the output will stay the same. Okay, and in a sense, it encodes what we want, the apparent knowledge about the graph. The order of the vertices doesn't matter. And once we use a fully connected network, then this doesn't hold anymore. And then you get into issues of, okay, well, you can try and augment your data and see many permutations, but Often it doesn't work as well in practice because of these issues. Okay, great. This, this makes a lot of sense, but then I don't understand how it is connected to what you described in the introduction. Because if we're going to, to talk about the advantages of uh, graph neural networks in terms of, in terms of uh, sample complexity or in terms of computational complexity, then in uh, parallel to what uh, people have done, have done on uh, convolutional net neural networks to understand the advantages of them in terms of sample complexity or computational complexity, then it makes a lot of sense to study 
uh, GNNs in the same manner. But what you said in the beginning had nothing to do with sample complexity, it had right. nothing to do with computational complexity, right, nothing because, to do with expressivity. Because I'm not going to analyze that. That's work that other people have done. And these GNNs are well motivated. These are things that are done in practice, and they work very well. So in this talk, I'm not going to motivate why we should use GNNs, but rather GNNs are already, I think, quite well established, and there are other works that analyze perhaps advantages in terms of, exp uh, of generalization, why you should use them in terms of inductive bias over other types of networks. They're still not perfect, and they're also obviously going for improvement, but the idea here is to shed light by, about why they work well, the limitations, and provide practical applications for these GNNs that are used today in practice. Okay, so I'm not claiming in this talk why you should use these type of networks over others. I'm just trying to... But you are, you are going to ask the question of what type of functions can be realized by this type of uh, GNN, right. right? This is the main question of the talk. Right. And I think the answer is every function that you can compute, you can also express with a GNN. You, so just need, you just need the number of layers to grow with a runtime of any algorithm on graphs. So the perspective we're going to take is going to be slightly different than that, but first off, we're going to mainly focus on finite size GNNs. And this is part of the idea of not looking at asymptotic analysis of universality. And the second part is I'm not sure that for GNNs that's true. It's quite counterintuitive at first, but it relates to the first problem that we said with the ability to distinguish non-isomorphic graphs, that GNNs are actually limited. They're not the typical GNNs, at least these ones. Uh, they're not universal in the sense that uh, you can grow them arbitrarily large, they won't be able to realize any continuous function over the feature. So, so maybe this is the exercise question, is there any constraint on W here? Um, so for example, the different uh, eyes could have different number of neighbors. Right, but it's the same W, it's, for each layer it's the same W. W depends only on the layer. Right, but if you have the same, different number of neighbors in the same layer, then you can't multiply it by the same W. Oh, because Why the, not? You, you yeah, multiply each one of them separately. I see, the yeah, embedding is always the same size. Exactly. I see. Yeah, and typically, because you have different type of neighbors, then this aggregation function may normalize, for example, by the sum of neighbors. That's what people do. Okay, so maybe I'll continue and have it be our point of attack will become clear. Okay, so I introduced these GNNs, and now what we do with the embeddings that we get in the end, it depends on the task. So if we're in a graph prediction task, where we make a single prediction, then typically what people do is you have another aggregation function over these embeddings, and then some linear output there. Okay, it's straightforward. And in vertex prediction, we want to make a prediction over each vertex t separately. So you can simply use the linear output layer over each of the final embeddings of the, these vertices separately in the iterative prediction. And this is what's commonly done. Now, our goal is to analyze the interaction that these type of models can, that these type of networks can model uh, for a measure that we'll soon introduce. And prior works that have done a similar thing, they've actually focused on neural networks which have polynomial nonlinearity. Okay, many of these works were actually done here in Amnon Shashua's lab, and they use the fact that you can express these neural networks with polynomial nonlinearity through what is known as tensor networks. Okay, their exact technical details is not super important, but this is a graphical language for expressing arith arithmetic operations known as tensor contractions. Okay, basically in this graph here, this is the computation graph of the network where each node is a tensor, a multidimensional array, and an edge between them means that they're contracted. That you have, this is a generalization of matrix multiplication. Okay, so basically we can represent the computation graph of these networks through tensor networks, and this allows analyzing the interaction that they model using the measure of separation of each other. And the natural question that you might be thinking is, well, why should we care about these networks, the polynomial nonlinearity? And then these are not what we use in practice often. They're not as common. And while indeed they're not as common, I claim that they still have significant interest behind them. And the first part is, although they're not state of the art in most cases, they're still competitive in practice. Okay, people have used them and run them in practice, and they can work. So it's not just a theoretical construct. These are networks that can work. And the second Thing, which is more important from our perspective is that from the theoretical analyses of these works, then the insights that we get, they have been demonstrated empirically over other types of networks that are more common. 
for example, with other types of nonlinearity, such as rel. And this also led to development of practical tools. And we're going to follow this line in the sense that we're going to study GNNs where the aggregation is going to be a product. Okay, so if we go back to the update rule of our GNN, then we will choose this aggregation function to be an element-wise product, okay, the Hadamard product. This means that the function has polynomial nonlinearity with respect to x. And indeed, what we show is that you can represent these GNNs through tensor networks. The computational graphs here are quite more complex than what we had with the other types of networks. Specifically, they depend on the structure of the input graph, and they can change depending on, okay, you can have different input graphs to the GNN. This will create different tensor networks. So indeed, these networks are not as common in practice as, for example, the GCN, where you use the aggregation to be a sum in ReLU. But this is a variant of a recently proposed GNN. It can work in practice. And more importantly, we're going to see that the conclusions or the findings from our theory, they actually apply in some sense also to other GNNs with ReLU nonlinearity, just standard GNNs. And this is going to also be the basis for the edge specification algorithm, the practical application, which also isn't limited just to these type of networks. Okay, so this is the model that we're going to analyze. And now let's see the measure of interaction that we're going to do this with. Okay, so it's called separation rank. And I'll br briefly mention that this is something that's been widely used for measuring the interaction that a function models across a partition of its input variables. Specifically in quantum mechanics, this is a measure of entanglement between partitions between particles, okay, in a many-body system. Okay, so we have a subset of particles and the separation rank, it measures the strength of interaction between these particles and the rest. And this measure was already so used for analyzing other types of neural networks, whether it's convolutional, recurrent, or self-attention networks, and we're going to use it to analyze GNNs. Formally, let's say that we have a function, a multivariate function f, which has n input variables. Each one of them can be a d-dimensional vector. And for simplicity, let's assume that the output is a scalar. Now, any subset of input variables i here, it induces the partition of the input variables, right? To those in i and those that are outside of i. The separation rank of f, it is a measure of the interaction that f models with respect to the partition induced by i. It's defined to be the minimal r, such that we can express f as a sum of r terms, okay? Each one of them is a product between two functions where one of them operates only over the input variables in i, and the other operates over the remaining input variables. You can see that this is a sort of generalization of matrix rank to arbitrary functions. And the higher the separation rank, the stronger the interaction between x i and x i complement. How you can intuitively read this is that these g functions here in the definition, they can be arbitrarily complex. Okay, we have no limitations over them. But in order to realize f, we can only combine them in a simple way. Okay, each one of them is limited by the fact that it can only operate over xi or over xi complement. And then to combine them to realize f, we have only a product and a sum. And so intuitively, the more elements we need in this sum, the more complex this combination function needs to be, and the stronger the interactions are. There are also other interpretations for this measure. For example, in a statistical context, when f is a probability density function, and so are these g's, then separation rank of one exactly means that xi and xi complement are statistically independent. So we can use this as a, dist a sort of measure of distance from being separable. Right? Yeah. So the complement group and the group, like, do you, like, how do you choose them? So th this is defined for every i. For every subset of, of input variables that you choose, then you have this measure. So indeed, this measure is a, it's not a single measure. Basically, you, for any partition of input variables, you have a measure. Is, is there a limit that R must be less equal to N, or theoretically it's impossible? It could be that R is infinity, like there is no... Uh, so it depends on the function. type of function you consider, but yeah, for example, general functions, then R can be infinity. So yeah. There is no... Complexity. Yeah, for example, in L2 space, functions in L2, then the separation rank, uh, you can always uh, represent a function as such a sum in products, but the sum may be infinite in some cases. It can only be a limit. Right, so in our case, f is going to be a GNN, and the input variables are going to be corresponding to vertices. Okay, so the separation rank will measure the interaction that it measures between the features of the vertices, the okay, partition of vertices. And the quantity that is going to be key here is what we call the walk index of the partition. Okay, say that we have some graph here, and a partition of vertices to blue vertices in i, and red vertices in i complement. Then 
Let's denote by CI the boundary of the partition. These are the vertices that have an edge to the other side. Now, suppose that we run a depth LGN over the graph. In the context of graph prediction, we define the L minus one walk index of I to simply be the number of length L minus one walks that originate from here, from the boundary of the partition. Okay, so it's a straightforward definition. It's just the number of walks originating from here that can end anywhere of length L minus one. Okay, length one less than the depth of the genus. Say, for example, we have a depth three GNN, then what's going to be important is the two walk index. So we're going to look at all walks of length two originating from here. For example, have this one from here to here, or this one goes from here to here. And I think in this graph, if you include self loops, there are 48 walks of length two from that area. In the context of vertex prediction, we have an analogous definition, but if we make a prediction over a vertex T in the graph, then what's going to matter is only the walks that end at T. Okay, this is so intuitive. So the L minus one T walk index of I, that's going to be the number of length L minus one walks that originate from the boundary of the partition that end at T. Okay, are there any questions about the definition? This seems like a very fundamental quantity and actually we were quite surprised to not find an existing definition or name for it, so we call it the walk index of the partition. So walk is just a path is a walk where you can't go over, I think, the same edge, the same edge twice. So a walk is simply you can the, you go from here to here, and you can also go back. And just any, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to say it differently, any, but any sequence yeah, of any edges. any sequence of that nodes are, are connected by an edge. Right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So any sequence of nodes are connected by edges of length L. Yeah, that originate here in this gray area from the boundary. Okay, so for example, you can have a walk that starts here and goes there and comes back or goes to here and just count all of them. Okay, basically this counts something about the computation graph of the GN, right? Because it keeps aggregating messages from the neighbors. Now with this definition in place, we're ready to see the main result. Basically, for a depth LGNN, of width D, width, this is the size of the hidden dimension of the embeddings, and any subset of vertices of V. Okay, we can have this picture back in mind. We have just a partition, and I, this is a subset of vertices that it induces this partition. Then what we show is that the separation rank of the GNN with respect to I, it is upper bounded by the width D, and in the power we have the L minus one one index of I. In the context of vertex prediction, we have an analogous result, but now only walks that end at t matter. Okay, if we make a prediction over a vertex t, then the separation rank it is upper bound by the L minus one t walk index. And these are upper bounds, but we also have nearly matching lower bounds. And let's parse this result and see that we have here all the quantity that we wanted. So we wanted a dependence on the graph structure and the size of the GNN, some quantity that depends on the architecture. And we see here that the width of the GNN, it comes here, we have a polynomial dependence on it. The depth, it affects the length of the walks that we consider. And in terms of the graph structure, that comes into play in terms of the walk index, okay? The number of walks that originate from the boundary of the partition. And basically, given some GNN that we have, what this implies is that the walk index of a partition, this is what primarily controls the strength of interaction that a GNN can model between them for this measure. Are so T T is a target vertex. So G N N T, this is the function that G N realizes where you have make the prediction over vertex T. It's the target vertex. So L minus one T walk index is the number of length L minus one walks originating from here, from the boundary of the partition, the end at T. Okay, D is the width, L is the depth of the network. T is a target vertex, and I is just any subset. Okay, there's something that applies to them. So you have, on your right side, you have a term that has nothing to do with the network. It has to do only with the graph. Right? This, you, is, this is the quantity of, of the graph, and on the left no, side... The D, the depth is... Yeah, oh, so, right, only so, the depth. So D, D is actually... D, well, yeah, sorry, no, sorry okay. for the computer. L is the no, number but of But D and L yeah. are numbers. Right. So, so for yeah. any numbers D and L, Right. This quantity depends on the graph, and the right exactly. side depends on the network. The, this is the separation rank. This is the measure that we saw before of the function of the network. Yeah, and okay, it so, so, so 
Effectively, what you're saying is I can bound some quantity of the network, expressivity, blah, 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 right. by some other quantity of the graph. Exactly. Okay. exactly. So w why, w what I'm trying to understand is why is this expressivity of the network important? In what sense? Right. W how would I use it? So I think that's a good question. It's a more general question. In terms of these measures of expressivity, what can they tell us? And I think in this case, the perhaps main motivation behind it is the practical application of the galaxy. It also brings insights to when we should expect genes to work more or less good. For example, when you have higher or less separation, and intuitively you'd expect them to work better when the separation rate is higher. And we'll see an example in, this, in a bit, but also we have the practical application that is based off of this theory. And this is the main motivation behind looking at these interactions, these strength of interactions. And I think there's also a lot of work to be done to better understanding exactly what separation rank characterizes. For example, characterizing different functions and what their separation rank is. And then perhaps we can also use this measure to provide separation results between uh, what gene ends can realize or not. So giving exact functions that they simply cannot realize without a certain size. Uh, yeah, this is also a direction this can be taken, but yeah, for now the main motivation is that we're going to see the insights that provides from these genes. Okay, so before I move on, I uh, just will go over a brief proof sketch. It's just going to be over the upper bound. The lower bound is a bit more technical. And for the graph prediction, the proof for the vertex prediction case is analogous. And the details of this slide, they won't matter for the rest of the talk. So if you want to check your emails now and don't care about the specific technical details, now it's a good time and you can get back in the next slide. And if you're interested, so you can listen. And the main point here, I actually already mentioned it, where we can represent these GNNs with product aggregation as tensor networks. Okay, specifically, this represents the computation graph of the network, where each vertex, as I said, is a tensor, and these connections, they imply certain operations. And to be more precise about the structure of this computation graph, the leaves here, they correspond to the features of the vertices. Okay, so each leaf, it corresponds to one, ver one uh, feature vertex, and they can be multiple leaves that correspond to the same original vertex. Okay? And the interior nodes here, they represent the layers of the gene, the operations that it does over the input. And the main idea here is to use this structure. And once we have it, we can import tools from tensor analysis in order to show that the separation rank of the gene with respect to a partition of the input vertices, it can be upper bounded by cuts in this tensor node. Okay, specifically, it is upper bound by the minimal cut in this computation graph that separates the leaves that are associated with the original vertices in I between the leaves that are associated with the vertices with I complement. Okay, so I'll just iterate it to make it more clear. The leaves in this computation graph, each one of them, it represents an original vertex. There can be multiple leaves corresponding to the same vertex. And what we are looking for are cuts in this computation graph that separates the leaves that correspond to I from the leaves that correspond to I complement. Each cut will give us an upper bound. And so to finish our proof, all that we need is to find a cut that this is its way. Okay, and this is the whole thing. Okay, so now let's get back to a more high level view. So those who check their emails, now it's a good time to come back. And a straightforward implication of this result is that if we have the same graph and two partitions in it, okay, this is a graph, two clicks connected by a single edge. And in one partition, we have a relatively low walk index. For example, in this one, we have only two vertices on the boundary of the partition. And so its walk index is relatively low compared to this partition, okay, where all the vertices are on the boundary. Essentially, everyone is connected to a vertex on the other side. Then what our theory shows is that we can only model low separation rank with respect to this partition, but a higher separation with respect to this one, meaning that GNNs, they can model strong interactions across partitions with a higher walk index. And intuitively, this formalizes the conventional wisdom where GNNs can model stronger interactions between areas of the graph that are more interconnected. Essentially, this word interconnected, it is often used informally. And what our theory suggests is that a good interpretation for it is the walk index, the number of walks that originate from the boundary of the partition. Now, the theory is just for GNNs with product aggregation, but more generally, what it suggests is that if we have two tasks, in one of them we need to model strong interactions across a partition with a low walk index. 
And in the other, we need to model interactions across the partition with a higher work index. Then what it suggests is that the GNS will perform better on the data sets that have a higher walk index. Okay. The partition that is important has a higher walk index. And to see if this is indeed the case, we run experiments. And now this is experiments with just standard GNNs with relative nonlinearity, such as GCN, GAT, or GIN. If these acronyms don't say anything to you, it's perfectly fine. These are just three very popular GNNs. And what we're going to do is we're going to run them on a controlled setting where we have two data sets where one of them indeed you need to model interactions across a low walk index partition and the other, you have a high walk index partition. Now, there are many ways in which you can think of constructing such data sets, but what we went up, ended up going for is just the following graph prediction task. Okay, so in both data sets, it's the same task. Each graph encodes two randomly sampled fashion MS images. This can easily be just any other image data set. And we encode these images in the graph by taking their patches of pixels and putting them as the feature of the person. And the goal is to predict whether the images are the same or not. They are not the same, whether they have the same class or not. What is the graph? Exactly, so I'm okay. just gonna show it in a bit. Okay, so the task in both data sets is the same. So we're going to have multiple graphs and they're all going to have the same structure. Okay, this is a sample from the first data set and this is from the second data set. The structure is exactly what we saw in the slide before. It's two clicks connected by a single edge. What differs between the data sets is what you see in the colors. This is how we assign the patches of pixels of the images to the vertices. So in the first data sets, each click holds all the patches of pixels from a single image. And in the second one, each click will hold half of the patches from the first image and half of the patches from the second image. Now, in order to solve this task using a GNN, it needs to model interactions across the partition separating the images, okay? And in the first data set, it has low walk index, as we saw, while in the second one, it has a relatively higher and so what we'd expect is that they will perform better on this data set. And this indeed, this... Is encoded in the W matrix that you said before? Hmm? This is encoded in the W in the neighbor of the matrix? So the W is the parameters of the GNN, and so this is encoded in the Xs, in the features of the vertices. Essentially, each one of these vertices it has a vector of features, and that vector of features will be a patch of pixels from the image, from fashion. Sure, but this, this graph that you talk about, It's the input of the GNN. So the input is uh, each one of these vertices has a feature vector, mm -hmm. and you give this as an input to the GNN. So you compute the updates that I showed before, the message passing updates, make a prediction. So this is the input to the GNN. The W is the matrix, the parameter matrices of the, that you train using gradient descent. So the neighbors that you talk about is not related to the graph that you have? No, the neighbors are here. This, this, this very graph. The updates are based on the structure of the graph. The GNN for a different graph, the GNN does different operation. It determines its condition. And how did you choose the couples of images? They're just two images from the same... So they're uh, randomly sampled from fashion and this, and we do that in a way that so the data will be balanced, okay? So we first... But they must be from the same class, or...? No, so we first sample the label, whether it's 0 or 1, okay, 1 if it's the same class, 0 otherwise. If it's 1, we, sa we sample so two, two from images the from the same class. Okay. If it's 0, we just sample one image, and then sample another from the remaining mm, classes. Okay. Okay, right. And there, this is just a specific example. You can do the same thing with perhaps any other task, reasonable task that you require interactions between these partitions and that partitions. This is just an arbitrary choice in that sense. And the results that we get, they align with the theory in the sense that we have the three common GNNs, and we see both the train and test accuracies, the exact numbers aren't important, but they're substantially higher when you run the GNN over the second data set with the higher walk index. Where essentially the, the task is exactly the same, only the partition that you need to model interactions across has changed. Okay, so the bottom line here is that in accordance with our theory, we see that indeed also for other types of genes, not just with product aggregation, when the partitions that require higher interactions, uh, with the partitions that require modeling interactions across have a higher walk index, then genes tend to perform better. And this is a controlled task, essentially to try and verify and trying to see this in uh, just real world data sets, it's a bit more messy, and I think it's also something that's open to try and see whether we can understand that. Yeah. So basically, you are saying that throw away the GNN and just take it a full graph, and if it's not graph GNN, it's fully connected, then you will get the best performance. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. In terms of expressivity, in some sense, this is what our measure says. Yeah, so in that sense, it can't explain the fact that this is not something good to do. And the reason is because it's not just a matter of expressivity in that case. It's also, again, depends on matters of generalization. Once you change the graph, so you... So that's my problem. My problem is that you are taking just half of the story, the expressivity question, and what the theory is telling you is something that is basically trivial. If you do not constrain, or the more you constrain the architecture, the less expressive you will become. Okay. So, so, I mean, in terms of qualitatively, this is what you are saying, right? Because uh, so, um, higher rank is less, uh, is less constrained. Yeah, but I think the main benefit here is that you have this measure, quantity and measure that you can compute, and then you can use it. Before that, you didn't have any measure. So what you're saying is indeed intuitively. I'm not claiming that these results are not intuitive. But in a sense, it's not clear, okay, how you should try, like, this measure gives you something that can work with. For example, you try to, what we'll see next is that you try to preserve the interactions that you can model in the graph when you remove edges. And this gives you a quantity that you can track and use. And so this is the main benefit here, that you have a formal quantity. I'm but not, in this, I'm not buying it because the, the, the big issue here is, is a trade-off, like everywhere in machine learning. You have a trade-off between uh, how much you're constrained by architecture, how much prior knowledge it gives you, okay? So prior knowledge is helpful if it is correct, and it is not helpful if it is not correct, okay? Now, there are plenty of ways to, uh, to define constraints on, uh, on graphs. Okay? You defined one, but without telling you that this measure also relates to better generalization, then it's somehow arbitrary, right? So because at the end of the day, the performance will be according to the trade-off between the two. So, in one sense, I agree with you. This measure doesn't tell you everything, and I didn't claim that it tells you everything. And I think in that way, any part of the literature, usually, in some simple cases, at least in deep learning, doesn't tell you everything. It's all of this. Some perspective that gives you some advantages, but it also has gaps and disadvantages. And yet, in this sense, this theory has a disadvantage in that we're only looking at expressive power. And this is currently all the, pretty much all, not all, but most of the theoretical analysis for JNs are around expressivity. And there's a major challenge in trying to understand better also optimization and generalization. But I don't agree that this is trivial or not informative. And I think the main claim that I'm going to make that is going to argue for that is that we're going to use this theory, okay, this quantitative measure of walk index, for a practical application, for an edge specification algorithm, and it will actually outperform existing methods. So at least in that sense, I don't think that it's uh, cheap, right? because it's not something that we would have gotten to without this theory. So, yeah. But I agree, it's not perfect, and it's not complete in any way. And I haven't claimed that. Anymore. So th there are assumptions about the graph, which uh, we can assume the graph, our assumptions about the graph are, are, are true, are not a decision of the, of the um, algorithm developer or the scientist. And there are um, uh, assumptions about the, the network, the GNN we chose. So there is something that's at least not fully trivial by saying, okay, some property of the graph implies some property of the network. Yeah, for sure. So, so but, but I don't think I, I agree. And there's also wrong with what, what, what you said, but I think that something is missed here, which is if, if the theory needs to, needs to give some hints to practitioners how to tackle data, okay, then now I'm coming to a new problem. When should I use a graph? What graph should I use? Okay, so now, if you are telling me the answer is, uh, the answer from the theory is, is not clear because you are saying, okay, in terms of specificity, use a full graph. In, right, terms, so of, uh, in terms of in terms of generalization, I don't know, and in terms of fitting to the data, I also don't know. Okay, so that's a very good point. I just want to clarify that indeed, uh, that this theory, at least we haven't looked at it, it doesn't give you many hints. So given a data which the graph structure is unclear, which structure you should use. The theory is more beneficial in the case where you already have a graph and it's clear what the graph is, and then it gives you hints of whether, how should you expect the gene to behave, and specifically, as we'll see now, it's going to give an algorithm of when you need to remove edges for efficiency case, and you want to preserve the accuracy. But indeed, 
Uh, this doesn't tell you anything about whether you have the uh, data where it's not clear what the graph structure is and which graph structure to use. Because as you said, in terms of separation rank, if you have a fully connected graph, that's the best. But this is not true in terms of generalization. For example, if you take a graph and add all the edges, you lose the semantic information that you had in it. And also it creates matters of generalization regardless to that. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's completely true. Yeah. So could you please go on with how did you construct the graph and why does it relate to your measurement? I'm not sure if I missed it now. Yeah. Uh, so I think due to interest of time, perhaps it's better that I continue. Okay. But it, the main point here is that it's just a synthetic control task where in one, you need to monitor actions across a low walk-in expectation, the other, and but we can go over the details afterwards again, but they're not super important. That's why I don't want to stay on them too much. And this basically concludes the theoretical analysis part. And now we're going to move on to the practical application for which is the main motivation behind it. And the idea is that computations over large-scale graphs can be quite expensive in terms of memory and compute. And so one way to address this is edge specification algorithms. Okay, this is something that people did way back also. And the idea is to try and remove edges from the graph while maintaining stump properties. Different areas of computer science try to maintain different properties. For example, in theoretical computer science, often people are interested in weights of cuts and in distances in the graph. In network analysis literature, people are often interested in statistical properties, such as the distri degree distribution. And in the context of GNNs, what we care about here is maintaining the accuracy that we can get when running a GNN over the graph okay. as we remove edges. As, as we're going to see now, our theory leads to a simple and effective recipe for which edges we need to remove, where the idea is to remove edges that harm the ability to monitor actions the least, and hopefully this will translate to better accuracy. Okay, so recall that our theory said that given some partition, okay, a subset of versus i that induces a partition, the quantity that is important for model interactions is the walk index. And so we can use this to try and remove edges which harm walk index the least in order to preserve interaction. And we're going to do probably the most straightforward thing that you might have thought of, which is greedily removing the edge each time, which harms the ability to model interactions across favored partitions the least. And I think the best way to see this is just by example. So let's say we have some graph. Then the general scheme here is going to be in iterations for each edge that we want to remove. First off, we need to decide which partitions are important for the task. This indeed requires some prior knowledge about the task at hand. And for the sake of example, let's say that we want to preserve the interaction between the left and right side and the top and bottom side. Okay, we have these two partitions. Now, for each edge that remains in the graph, what we do is we temporarily remove it and compute what the walk indices with respect to these partitions will be after it's removed. So we start with the first edge, we remove it, and compute the walk index with respect to the first one and the second walk index. Give, this gives us a topo. Here it's a pair of walk indices. And we bring that edge back, move on to the second edge, and do the same thing. Okay? At the end of this process, we have for each edge a tuple of walk indices. And then what we do is we simply remove the edge that has a maximal tuple in some order over tuples. Okay? This is also something that we need to decide upon. This is essentially the edge that after we remove it, in some sense harms the walk index harms the ability to monitor actions across these partitions the least. For example, here we can say that it's this edge and we remove it. Now, this is a general scheme. In order to really cut out an algorithm out of it, we need to decide about which partitions we care about and the ordering of the tuples. So what we do, we focus on vertex prediction tasks because these are usually most relevant in larger graphs. For example, social networks, we often make predictions over each of the vertices. And in this case, the algorithm that we Use, we call it the L minus 1 walk index specification. L minus 1 is because it, it uses L minus 1 walk indices. This is an algorithm that is compatible with depth L GNNs. Okay, it is intended for them. And the idea is that if we make a prediction over each of the vertices, then we better be able to model interactions between the vertex and the rest of the graph. And so, one natural choice for the partitions that we care about is to take all the partitions that separate a vertex from the rest of the graph. So the number of partitions here is equal to the number of vertices in the graph. This is one common choice. You can also try others. And the second thing that we need to decide upon is how to order the walk index tuples. Now, on the face of it, the prediction over each vertex is equally important. So we would like to make removals that don't harm significantly the ability to a model interaction across 
one of these partitions as opposed to the other. So in order to make these balanced removals, we will order the tuples by their minimal entry and break ties into the second small and so forth. Basically, to wrap it up, what it means is that for each edge, we will temporarily remove it, compute the walk indices with respect to these partitions that we care about, and then we will remove the edge whose minimal walk index is maximum. Okay? The minimal walk index is maximum. And break ties using the second small and so forth. Now, as you might have noticed, this requires us to compute the number of length L minus one walks in the graph. And one way to do this is just taking powers of the adjacency matrix. And this takes naively runtime that is cubic in the number of versions of the graph, which can be quite expensive for large graphs. But fortunately for us, if we look at one walk index specification, or in short, WIS, then it turns out to have a particularly simple and efficient equivalent implementation. That's based that's degree. Hmm? Isn't one walk just degree? It's right, it's just a degree, but even it's, it requires an something beyond a just degree. Indeed, this algorithm only depends on degrees, but we'll see that it has an equivalent firm that doesn't require us to remove an edge each time and compute walk indices. You can only look, you can look on the degrees of the graph itself and make a prediction from that, and not make a prediction, but uh, choose the edge that you need to remove from that. And uh, yeah, this will only require linear time and space. And basically the algorithm is very simple. It has only two steps. The first one is you need to compute the degrees of the vertices. Okay, you can do this also once at the beginning and then update the degrees as you remove edges. And the second thing is that you simply remove the edge whose minimal degree is maximum. Okay, each edge, you can associate it with two degrees, the degrees of the two vertices that it connects. Then you remove the edge whose minimal degree is maximum. And you break ties using the maximum degree. This is equivalent to the algorithm that we saw before where L is equal to two. Okay, so this is compatible with depth two. GNNs, but as we'll see, you can do this as a sort of efficient approximation for the higher order uh, walk index specification algorithms. And so we can use this for the sake of efficiency. Okay, and we're going to see next that it actually performs almost similar. Okay, so how do we evaluate them? So we compare to several baselines. So the first one is just naively removing uniformly at random edges. The second is a spectral specification algorithm. It wasn't per uh, it wasn't proposed in the context of GNNs, and its purpose is not to maintain the prediction accuracy, but rather to maintain the Laplacian of the graph. Okay? But we still compare to it as a representative of more classical methods. And lastly is really a recent method that was designed for GNNs that tries to maintain the prediction accuracy by learning in a supervised way, supervised way which edges to remove. So what we're doing is we take standard vertex prediction data sets and use our algorithm as well as these to remove edges from them and then compare the prediction accuracy that we get using just the standard GNN over each of the sparsified graphs. Here it's going to be depth three GCN, okay? Probably the most popular GNNs there are, but we have similar results also with other architectures and also on other data sets that I'm not sure. The picture is pretty much the same over all of them. And if we start with Cora, which is sort of the fashion MNIST of uh, graph data sets, this is a citation network. Each vertex is a publication and edges, they represent citations. Then what we see here is the test accuracy as a function of the percentage of edges removed. And we see that in blue here is both 2WS and 1WS. Okay, so 2WS is compatible with the depths of the GCN, and 1WS, you can do this as a sort of efficient approximation. This is the algorithm that we saw before, just depending on degrees. And you can see that they bring about higher prediction accuracies, substantially higher across all the sparsities. Yeah. What, what are you trying to do these? Right, so the, the labels of the vertices, it's a good question, I didn't say, it's the category of the paper. Okay, so we, the features of the vertices is, I think, embedding the a bag of words embeddings for the, for the abstract, perhaps, is summing from the paper, and the goal is to predict the category. Of so yeah, as a training data, you have some subset of the, you have only one large graph, as a training data, you get labels for a subset of vertices, you train a genome over that, and then you use it to predict for unseen vertices. And you remove 100% of the edges, you still get like... Right. And, and the reason for that is because you have features for the vertices. So okay. given a single uh, paper, you can predict its category not trivially, but if you have information from the graph, then it helps. This is what it should. For example, there are actually data sets in the GNN literature where we, what we saw, and also other people observed this, where you get a flat line in the sense that the graph structure doesn't even matter. So what we see here is a graph that indeed does matter. 
And now we're going to go to larger scale graphs. These are still the same type. These are citation networks. But for example, the archive data set already has more than a million edges. And here we see the same trends, where now we only value one WS because running two WS can be quite expensive over these large graphs. But we see that works very well. So the bottom line is that our theory led to this WS edge specification algorithm, which is simple and efficient to run and outperforms the existing methods in terms of the prediction accuracy we can get. And of course, it also releases its code. And if you're interested, feel free to check it out. It's quite simple to just run. Okay, so are there any questions before I conclude? Great, so what we saw here had two parts. First, we start with the theoretical analysis where we saw that the walk index of a partition of vertices primarily controls the strength of interactions that GM can model, okay, the number of walks from the boundary of the partition. We then use this for a practical application, the edge specification algorithm, which we saw is both simple and efficient to run and outperforms the existing methods. And if we zoom out a bit then more broadly, we use this framework of studying the interactions that GM can model to better understand its expressive power and provide this practical application. But we believe that we can also use this to go beyond expressivity. As Shai mentioned, this is only part of the problem. And perhaps you can use it to understand also generalization, not only which type of interaction you can model, but what we end up actually modeling when we run, for example, grain descent, and how that might relate to generalization. And the second thing is that maybe we can use this to improve the performance of GNNs beyond edge specification. Okay, this is just one practical application. But perhaps you can use these guidelines to also design architectures that can model stronger interactions, or for example, to add edges to the graph that will increase walk index maximally in the sense of not adding too much though to reach other types of problems that people see in genes that lead to lack of generalization and to that improve performance. And with that, I'll finish. So thank you again for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any more questions. <laughs> well, maybe a, a more of a comment and a question. At the end of the day, I think it's very important to choose a, the correct baseline. So, but at the end of the day, there, there is there is a, a nice theory here, but the, but the algorithm is remove uh, edges by degree, which I would I would say it's a baseline. It's not an algorithm. So this is a special case of the algorithm where you take the gene index to be two. And it's true yeah, that I agree totally. But in it was the same as the other variant, more complicated than on, on one data set, and the other data set, you couldn't even run the other right. variant. So that's a very, and I agree so, with you that you would say, okay, why do I need this theory? I can just propose off the top of my head, let's remove the edge whose minimal degree is maximal, and let's do that, that's going to be great. But the, the thing is that people had, didn't do that before. And it's true that it's simple when you see it in hindsight, but the theory is what led us to this. We saw that we have the algorithm. This is a special case. And it's true. We could have thought of it without the theory. Really? But really, yeah, uh, that's, uh, you really think that we need the tensor networks and the rank, uh, rank of tensor networks in order to come up with the heuristics of removing edges by degree? So I don't think it's necessary. Definitely not. But I don't think also that's the whole purpose of the theory. So I think this is one practical application that we analyzed and discovered. Uh, but it's true. It's not, I don't think that this is just a f this specific thing is yeah. Is, uh, this is what justifies the whole theory. But I believe the theory also has other purposes. And it's true that you could have thought of this uh, algorithm without our theory. Maybe the specific case for this one. Uh, yeah, it's true. But in the, in the end, that's what brought it to it. So that's uh, all I can say about that. I guess. <laughs> yeah. But what you're measuring in experiments is generalization, which. Theory says nothing about right. Right. This is also something you would that actually predict that the train error right would be heard. Right. So this is also a good point. So in the synthetic experiments in the control environment, we see that there's also a difference in train accuracy. Now in these cases, often the train accuracy is just simply 100 percent. So the in terms of expressivity, you can't really see anything there. So this is another leap of faith. Yeah, it's true, and this is a sense of it's not indeed we don't have a, in these real world data sets and these experiments, we don't have a good separation of whether the improvement that we see is indeed due to expressivity as according to our theory, or maybe it's just some confounding factor that no, we... In fact, you have evidence to the contrary. 
if you have 100% in the train, ah, it's not so about the... About that, I'm not, I totally, no. don't totally agree because expressivity, I think, is not only about reaching 100% of the train accuracy because there are many cases in which you can reach 100% of the train accuracy, but in terms of population accuracy, it's not 100%. So in that case, it's not, it doesn't completely tell you that if you see 100% of the train accuracy, then indeed you reached maximal efficiency, the expressive efficiency that you need in order to reach high accuracy over the test. Uh, but I, I don't have a way to argue whether this is what's happening or not. So, so if you would weaken the network's expressivity, it, 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 the part that use it, uses the features, because as you pointed out, one of the questions, like even 100% removal still gives us whatever 70 something percent accuracy. So, and that comes from parts of the network that just use the features to predict the right. category. So, if you tweak the network such that that part, is has much lower expressivity. So you get to the point where when you are in 100% removal, you're practically 0% accuracy. Then probably the network will also lose its ability to overfit. It doesn't have the ability. And then maybe the grab, the, the, the diagram of the test, uh, the, the, sorry, the training results will be closer to what the AUS. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting thought that we can try and examine better the improvement in and expressivity in that regard, but it's also uh, not clear. We need to think of how we can do that, how we can limit the expressivity of this simple layer, because it's just a simple, so, so it's not too complicated. If, if you but, change something such that when you remove m yeah. most or all of the uh, uh, vertices, um, the, the accuracy uh, came down to zero, even in, uh, in training, then you know you did it. So yeah. I don't know how to do it. So I think it's a good, yeah, I think it's a good experiment to run, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. I think it's a good experiment to try. I'm not sure we got, need to think about how to do that. But yeah, if, if it's possible, then it does some, it gives you a better measure of the importance of the graph yeah. structure in terms of the training accuracy. Of it. So yeah, it's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.